Lecturing in the, um, to the 120 students in the big auditorium with absolute silence. You know, I was just overwhelmed. Uh, I walked out feeling that I had them in my palm of my hand. Uh, and I was not aware that I had that talent. <coughs> uh, and I uh, left the session and went over to Riverside Church. And uh, I'm not sure what I did. I probably cried, like I'm crying now. <clears throat> and I, uh, that was probably my first experience uh, of the fact that I had gifts uh, that were not of my making. Now, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, see that as a religious experience, although I conceptualize it that way. But I was overwhelmed. Uh, because I did not grow up with language, you know, I grew up with math and pictures and symbols and things of that kind. And to be uh, aware at the age of 33 or something that I had the qualities of the gift of speech uh, was amazing to me, uh, which it still is. Mm -hmm. And it was about that time then that I also probably started to wander into the small chapels at, behind uh, St. John's um, main altar. Uh, partially because of that and partially because I was still single and I was worrying about my who I was and what I was and so on and so forth. Uh, and it, it was at that time that I was indeed beginning to read uh, the um, the mystical literature with a heavy focus on uh, on um, Evelyn Underhill. Uh, uh, and the other experience in terms of the faith aspect, and again I, I wouldn't necessarily identify it as faith because it's in, indeed uh, an experience of, 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 of the mystery um, that I was aware of participating in. Uh, I was aware, I was a bachelor then, and I remember one time, and I would go through minor depressions. I was never caught up in depressions, but I would have minor weekend depressions or things like that. I remember one time standing in my studio apartment saying, uh, and I must have been feeling reasonably depressed on the weekend or something. Like that. I said, why the hell don't I, I'm not sure how I phrase this, why the hell don't I kill myself? And I said, you can't kill yourself. You didn't give yourself life, you can't take it away. You know, I have, that was just as simple as that uh, kind of thing. And, uh, so yes, it has a faith dimension, but not faith in a traditional Christian sense. I'm very much aware that we do not comprehend and cannot comprehend either the mystery beyond or the mystery within. Uh, whether you want to call that Holy Spirit or whether you want to call it God, I'm not comfortable calling it God anymore. I, I just, I don't, God language doesn't work for me. And Jesus language doesn't work for me. I just, uh, when I uh, was uh, being considered at Yale, Ellis Nelson, uh, where, with whom I had been working for several years in religious education, wrote a letter and he sent me a copy of it. And he you know, commented on my, my work and what I did. He said, I, I presume he's a nominal Christian. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And that's, that's probably the way to uh, reflect it. So I, uh, I've had too much association with uh, Jewish students and uh, too much reading in uh, Eastern religions and too much familiarity with sort of rational theology of Tillich and Niebuhr. And, um, but also very, very uh, uh, influenced by the cloud of unknowing um, Meister Eckhart, uh, Brother Lawrence, you know, that literature, uh, it, it, it was, it's very, and it still is very moving and very powerful for me. And none of that is necessarily good Orthodox Christianity. Right. Yeah. You know. So I go to the chapel, uh, and I, I wouldn't have married Ellen if it hadn't, um, hadn't been that we weren't working together at, at uh, Yale. And we went to the same church, B. 
because I was going to an Episcopal church at that time, partially because my first wife was Episcopalian and partially because I had been associated with St. John the Divine. Uh, so, And I separate that kind of experiencing from my intellectual interest in theology in the way one articulates the religious experience. And that term, uh, you know, the uh, the lure of the transcendence, I have no idea how that popped into my mind. I don't know what I was reading at that time. I have no idea. I don't have any question about it. And when I work with people, I'm, in, I'm always aware of, uh, you know, there's more in you than you're aware of. You have to give up some of the things that you're holding on to in order to get there. Uh, you want, I'm not sure that I want to identify that as a theological statement uh, necessarily. And yet, finding ways of articulating that. Uh, but I don't find articulating that in a, with a Christology does anything for me. I don't, that doesn't work. Uh, Wal, uh, Walter and I, Walter Wink and I became very close. Uh, and Walter used to tell his stories of his own uh, religious awakening, so to speak. I, like, uh, do you, have you read his work, any of it? I think I did read something. I can't remember what book it was. It was an intro to Hebrew Bible that um, I read his work. So, oh, well, that's interesting. I okay. think, did he write a book called Who Wrote the Bible? No. He did not. He, his books, he did, uh, the first two books he wrote was the Bible and Human Transformation and then Transformation of Bible Study. Then the next three works that he did were all on, um, um, I know I've read them before. Uh, yeah, I want to think of, uh, it's fine. Yeah. The, the titles of the book. Um, Uh, he, he was dealing he, uh, essentially with, uh, he was very involved in the uh, situation of South Africa and, and I wrote a book on the third way. Well, well, that's the, 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 the series is the principalities and powers. He wrote a three volume series on the powers. Uh, the first exploring the biblical aspect of it historically and very carefully, exegetically. The third dealing in a sense with, he went down to Chile and lived for six months in South Africa because he felt he had to live in an oppressive uh, society in order to be able to write about oppression. It's very I, Arun, uh, Arun, uh, for, it's very for of him. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it ruined his health, uh, uh, really ruined his health. Wow. Uh, but then he was also involved in the South African situation and we, and this came together when we were working together. He, 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 brought, he wrote this book, The Bible and Human, not the, uh, the, the Third Way, uh, which is Jesus' Third Way. If you know his work, I don't know if you know his work, uh, but the, you know, the stuff that he did in terms of acting out um, the gospel. Uh, he, he did a variety of the parables, and, including turn your cheek, and he would act, have people act that out in terms of how do you turn your cheek. The only way to do that is to use the back of your hand, but the back of your hand implies equality. And therefore, you know, it's this kind of thing that you, you, you indeed, uh, as an oppressed people, are equal and you need to protest that. He, uh, wrote this and knew that he could not have it published or sent to South Africa. So every class that he went to, he'd bring a bunch of envelopes in his book, and each of us in our handwriting would address a different pastor in South Africa, and they would mail it. And the, the last experience he had there, he, he no longer uh, could get access, passport access or visa access to South Africa. So he came in by way of what's just north of South Africa, Zambia maybe, I don't remember. Um, he knew that he could not get by in the passport uh, and so they uh, were on one side of the border um, and it was a group and probably might have been a group from Fellowship Reconciliation, I'm not sure of this. Um, and they were singing a hymn uh, and I don't remember the name of him because it's very important, but I don't remember it. And it was raining the next morning. 
and they crossed the border and as they approached the border they heard the guard singing the very same hymn. <laughs> he said, we knew at that point that we were going to get in. He got in and he was having um, meetings and so on and so forth and he finally went to see foreign affairs uh, or the foreign affairs people in, in the government and said, I'm Walter Wink. And he said, how did you get, <laughs> how did you get into the country? <laughs> and Walter told him, he said, well, you're not supposed to be here. We're sending you out first class immediately. <laughs> Don't ever come back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, now how did I get onto Walter Wink? Uh, I don't remember how I got on to Walter Wink, but... Uh, you were just talking about how close you were with him? Oh, yeah. Well, Walter was telling his stories, his, his uh, stories of... Uh, he grew up in a, in a Methodist church and was very much uh, part of the youth group and very active in it. And he believed... Uh, he had a real a devastating experience with his family once. He didn't put his bike away. And his uh, father hid the bike, and uh, he came in, and his father said, uh, "Did you put your bike away?" And Walter said, "Yes." And his father said, "You've lied, because I put your bike away, and we are going to penalize you. You are going to spend the night in the garage by yourself." without anything. And it was done in such a way that... that no, he said, uh, Walter said, well, I'm going to leave. He said, where are you going to go? And his father said, and he would offer alternatives. He said, they won't want you. They won't want you. You have to spend the night in the garage. Walter was so upset by that, that it broke his relationship with his father. And, uh, and he used to retell that story frequently in, in our Bible study groups. And he said, uh, he, and then when he graduated from high school, he said, now, if, if, if the Bible is true and if Jesus is correct, that uh, you don't have to worry about the future, I'm going to go up in, into Oregon or Washington and maybe do some logging. And he, uh, he hitchhiked up. And he was looking for a place to stay, and there was no place to stay, and he knocked on the door. And uh, he said, do you have room for me? And she said, yes, I, we've been expecting you. Uh, and uh, I don't know if that's the expression that she used. And she said, I, we don't have a place, but you can s sleep either in the hallway or something like that. Uh, and uh, that reaffirmed his commitment to the church and to his own belief. And then he spent time doing that and had other experiences of that kind. So he, he had his own kind of mystical, uh, religious transforming experience, uh, which led him then into the seminary eventually. So, uh, but no, I've never had an experience like that, uh, you know. But, and yet, and I've, I've mentioned this, and I mentioned this at the uh, lecture I, not the lecture, but when I talked about my own history at my 90th birthday party. And I was aware, uh, and I mentioned it in, in that presentation, but I w was aware also very early, uh, probably before I was married, the first time, of uh, Thompson's The Hound of Heaven. Do you know The Hound of Heaven? Well, look, look it up. Okay. Uh, it's that The Hound of Heaven Chases You. Uh, you know, and I, I said, I, I'm not aware of ever having been lulled into something, but whenever I look back, I'm aware that perhaps the hound of heaven was chasing me. And when I uh, did this presentation a year ago, a year and a half ago, I said, you know, I'm, I'm not aware that I had any agenda, but every time I look back, uh, I am aware of grace. Uh, in that I have uh, indeed let a grace fill life. Uh, um, which again, I don't, I, I don't find easy to articulate in terms of God language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, grace, yes, I recognize as 
uh, has the mystery taking hold of you. Uh, and I can talk that way, but I can't. I have a hard time talking about God, and I have a particularly hard time using Jesus' language to talk that game. So that's a long discursion <laughs> on what you were talking about. Yeah. No. Sorry, I broke down. No, it's okay. Uh, um, I'm, su guess, I'm surprised that I broke down. But. Well, my question follow up if you want to answer, and we can move on. If not, why yeah. do you think you had to know? I'm not sure why I didn't, uh, because I, I guess I haven't talked about that in quite a while. I've talked about, I've very frequently uh, told that story, but I've never tell, told it with quite the kind of emotional content that I had now, and that could be because I'm close to my end, you know, who knows, I don't know. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that I'm aware that my father, I, and I mentioned this when I was talking a year ago at my birthday party, my dad also easily fell into tears. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that, you know, I probably have a genetic predisposition that as I get older, it takes over more and more, so to speak, so. How do you think you developed as a teacher over the years? Not just as a student. I was a miserable elementary school teacher. Okay. You know, I, I was not a good teacher. I, I, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think I became a fairly good college teacher, partially because of the way uh, Northern Illinois arranged their work. Uh, they had a really good elementary school training, teacher ed program as far as I'm concerned. In that the first year, uh, I mean the first year they had introductory psychology and I think I may have taught that, I'm not sure of that. And that was a lecture course with 60 and I don't remember having any problems with it. I don't know how I did. I have no idea of the quality of it. But the, uh, the second year was a, a uh, a major course in human development and maybe in psych combined. I'm not certain of that either. We'd have to go back and look at those catalog descriptions. Mm -hmm. We would have about 20 or 25 students in a seminar. And I don't know how many times a week we would meet, maybe two or three. And the students would spend maybe a half day a week, I'm not sure of that, in an elementary school classroom, in a single classroom. And we therefore would be looking at a child development and their own experience would be in the classroom uh, observing kids. Uh, and I was, um, I really enjoyed that kind of seminar teaching and I think became quite good at that. Part of that is because my doctoral work at Teachers College, we had an ongoing seminar with Herrick and other doctoral students or high level master students. So I was quite comfortable in that situation. <clears throat> and I uh, never felt that I had trouble teaching at the college level. Uh, I think I'd still have trouble teaching at the elementary school level because of the complexity of that task. But. Uh, have you kept in contact with any elementary students or anyone has looked you up from the elementary school? Well, that's one of the reasons I became an elementary school principal. Okay. Uh, because I was aware that people were critical of my theorizing, but also was quite comfortable that I knew enough about elementary teaching in elementary schools, at least intellectually, that I could help other people do it. And uh, I was a, a reasonably good elementary school principal. Uh, uh, but I had some really skilled teachers working with me and, uh, and I would spend time in their classrooms and, and sometimes help them and uh, they could have helped me more than I could have helped them probably because I'm not sure I could have managed a classroom. I could manage a school but manage a classroom. Um, and the elementary school principalship was one of the best educational experiences I had in terms of my own uh, competencies. I mean, uh, I, most gratifying, most satisfying I should say, really great. Because the, the principal is, a, is the key figure in a school uh, and they are badly prepared, which is one of the problems at teacher's college in terms of the separation of administration from uh, uh, supervision and things of that kind. I mean, administrators do not have enough con did not have enough contact with curriculum to know what the hell was going on. Have any of the elementary students that you had though as an elementary school teacher? Have they ever looked you up for no, 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 contact? no, 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 no. That was so long ago, you know, that was in the right. 50s. Were you, you said you were 
I know in college teaching you felt more comfortable. Were you ever intentional about becoming a better teacher? Did you have goals? Intentional about what? Being te a better teacher. Did you have goals every semester and be like, this is well? No. Fine. No, no. I, I, I almost never taught the same way. Uh, I, I, I don't think I fell into routines. I might have, not being conscious of it, I might have fallen into it. I was aware in my last years that I was getting routinized in terms of my basic course in curriculum theory, and that was a, an indicator that I better be careful. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that led to my thinking, oh, I better get the hell out of here, you know. And I was never too responsive to the evaluation forms that students did uh, because I don't think I was ever that adequately satisfied with my own teaching. I think I probably was sufficiently self-critical about that. I'm not, you know, that may have been pride on my part. I'm, I'm not sure of that, but I, I didn't feel that I was too routinized in that. I didn't teach the same damn thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Although I, before I quit, I found out that I was doing that, so I had to be careful, you yeah. know. This is a question that may not need to be answered because I asked a similar question yesterday. Um, so feel free just to say move on. So yesterday you said you'd like to be remembered for your photography, but as far as the curriculum world and even in the Christian education world or uh, art world, what would you like your legacy to be if you'd have to choose a legacy for those fields? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd answer that question uh, because I, I'm. Uh, in a sense, I don't, I don't, the word came to mind is disappointed, but I'm not sure I want to use that word. Uh, I regret that the work that I tried to do has not found uh, affirmation and support in the life of other people. I don't think my job has been finished, uh, and I know that I'm incapable of in terms of my age and my writing and my interest of, of finishing. I think the curriculum field is still a mess and I wish to God some people would work at it to fix it. And you're responsible for that. I'm okay. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, that I, and I'm not, I, and I, if I'm going to go to uh, a UBC for a week, one of the commitments I'm going to make is to make sure that whatever they do with my work, that they identify what the consequences for their work mm -hmm. in terms of the future. Uh, and I'm not going to do that unless that's clearly there because I don't want to go to be simply a role model or a, a historic figure recanting the past uh, unless I can indeed get some people to move in that direction. And I want to make a commitment from Bill that that's going to happen before I go. <clears throat> I don't want to be a historic figure. There's work that needs doing. and. I'm no longer capable of doing it, but it needs to be done. <clears throat> well, it still surprises me. I mean, your work spoke volumes to me, and I had to take it very yeah. slowly because it spoke so well. Yeah. I cannot, it, I do not understand why it was not more well received. I, mean, mm -hmm. I really don't know. I, I mean, it was really. Well, part of it's time, you know, and the pressures that it were on school teachers and curriculum people and so on and so forth, and running uh, the kinds of. Uh, quick solutions or newfound solutions that was going to cure everything. And the lack of historical attention. We're not a historically conscious people. Uh, Americans aren't and educators aren't. And uh, that's why I regret that Larry Kremen didn't do more as a good historian to focus in on the history of Teachers College and what needed to be done. Is there a reason why we are so anti-history? Because the problems of education, the problems of teaching are so severe and so demanding that they demand solution, but the assumption is that there can be found an immediate solution rather than recognizing that the problem is, histor is historical. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that what we have to do is to transcend our history. And we're not willing to do that. We want a, a solution which is ahistorical. And that's stupid. Right. Stupid. Yeah.